Hey there photographers, welcome back to the studio. So we have a ton to learn about our digital cameras yet and um, even like, you know, outside of the camera, retouching and all that, but um, I find that foraying into some analog tech at this point in the semester is a really kind of fun way to figure out what's going on with our digital camera. So much of what's going on on the digital camera has its origins in analog tech, right? I mean, it's, it's really obvious if you think about photography as a progression of both sort of artistic and technological innovations. So as a user of technology, right, photographers can't escape this, this sort of gravity of the technology. As a user of technology, um, it's really narrow, uh, it's really narrow sighted, really short sighted to imagine, right, that that piece of tech in your hands um, won't end up looking like this stuff um, pretty soon, right? And within a couple of years, your fancy piece of technology will appear appear like an analog piece of junk. And so it's it's worth kind of tracing backwards through time uh, the kind of tech that you have in your hand and actually being really nimble about it, um, understanding this tech, being able to use this tech, being really fluent in your DSLR tech. And I find that by having an experience with a manual 35 millimeter camera, you'll be even better and more informed when you pick up that DS, uh, that, uh, DSLR or your um, mirrorless micro four thirds or something like that. Um, so I guess maybe the first question would be like, well, what camera do you use? What should you go for? And it's got an easy answer, right? Use whatever you can find. Use whatever is around. Um, you may be uh, fortunate enough that you already own uh, a, a, you know, a film camera, a piece of analog tech, um, or more likely, right, somebody in your life has one. Mom, dad, uh, grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts, uh, brothers, sisters, just sort of friends, family. Um, it's really fun, I think, to use this as an opportunity actually to expand not only your understanding of camera tech, but to expand your sort of perception of what does it mean to be a photographer. Um, for years, right, uh, the sort of role of the photographer in society has sort of marched right alongside a lot of other things, right? And technology mirrors that. And so if you, you know, could get into a great conversation about photography with grandpa or with grandma, you get to understand what role that camera had in the family's life, in sort of culture's life, right? Um, the idea of that, that certain cameras are carried uh, back and forth to work. Think of a journalist, for example, photojournalist, or maybe even to war, right? A lot of these cameras that I've got here in my kit uh, come from wartime or just after uh, sort of the post-war period, 1950s, 1960s, right? There was a major um, boom in, in uh, sort of getting a camera into the hands of everybody. Uh, and so talking about that, right, maybe even comparing it in your head to like, how is that kind of like me and my smartphone? Or how is that really not like the way I imagine photography being, you know, what's the role of the say family photographer today versus what was it, um, you know, 20, 50, 70 years ago? Uh, it's, it's exciting to do that. Plus there are all these like awkward little offshoots, right, of like cameras that, um, you know, it's like they have kind of almost like a novelty function. This little German spy camera is one of my sort of awkward favorites. Like good luck finding the film for this thing, right? But it loads with, with each click and open and the trigger is just tiny. It's, you know, made to sort of fit into a pocket. It even goes into its leather sleeve and has, you know, a, a little, uh, a way for it to be a camera, you know, with it being like incredibly discreet, right? Now think about how discreet you can be with a smartphone versus, you know, a small micro camera like this. Um, but I guess my answer is you start with the camera you, you have close to you, and then as your interests develop and as you sort of navigate back through analog tech, you sort of find yourself gravitating towards, you know, maybe the fully automatic, you know, stuff that people carried in the 70s and the 80s. Or maybe you want to go back to the kind of heyday of 35 millimeter cameras uh, with the sort of Japanese post-war period uh, cameras. Um, these, uh, these sort of have... Um, a sort of lore around them, right? Photographers look for the particular lens or they look for the particular camera or the model or the color. Or frankly, you know, they disregard the tech and they grab onto, you know, some of these plastic toys or like the Lomo photography scene. Uh, so you will find a camera, right, that sort of matches your aesthetic vision. Uh, but for now, I think it's probably most useful for you to find yourself a fully manual 35 millimeter camera, something that you have control over shutter speed, aperture, and a manual focus, right? Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how to check the camera, make sure it's working okay in here, how to get the film loaded in, how to make sure you have the correct kind of film, um, and then um, what you need in order to prepare yourself for going out to, to uh, shoot this assignment. 
So maybe the first thing to do uh, when you get your camera, or when you find it, right, is you know to make sure that you're being careful with it. Um, just like uh, your digital cameras, right, a lot of these cameras, um, they're very fragile pieces of equipment. Uh, the glass in these lenses, right, is probably irreplaceable at this point. Um, and then when we kind of open up the back, a lot of the moving parts uh, are really fragile. Uh, but it's also possible, right, that this thing it was damaged before it even got to you. Uh, so say, for example, if I was going to go back in time to uh, shoot one of these sort of handheld 120 cameras, uh, these ones have a bellows that mounts on the front. Now the bellows on this, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Ansco Speedex. Uh, the bellows actually look reasonably okay. I wouldn't know until I actually shot some film through it to know that they're actually light proof, but I can just kind of give it a good look and uh, and see that you know they're not cracked, they're not falling apart. You know, by comparison, I've got this old uh, what appears to be probably a Kodak camera. And I'm going to open this one up, and you'll see almost immediately how uh, the bellows can be a real disaster. I mean, these are oftentimes paper or even leather, and those bellows, I hate to say it, are probably shot. They're not going to be light proof. Uh, this one doesn't even have the lens mounted to it anymore. So as cool of an old camera as this is, uh, I wouldn't run a roll of film through uh, because it's just not going to, uh, it's not going to work out. Uh, it's a really great find, but probably more of a shelf piece than something that's going to have any usable life for you. If I was going to be shooting in a camera like this, it's also really important to understand that uh, there are two sort of major categories of cameras that you're likely to run into. One of them uh, accepts 120 film. You can kind of see how uh, the 120 cartridge is a little bit taller here. And the other one, and I got to say this is probably far and away the most likely, is going to be some sort of 35 millimeter camera. This roll of film you'll see is, uh, is a little bit smaller and uh, it gets more exposures, right? There are about 36 exposures on a roll of 35 millimeter film and about 12 exposures, eight to 12 on your 120 film, depending on what sort of camera you're shooting with. Um, I have both 35 and 120 film in the HP5, the sort of film that we will use to uh, develop using our ID11 developing process. Uh, so I, if you happen to find a 120 camera, I'm happy to trade your 120 uh, for the 35 or vice versa. Um, the, the, the film that I buy is still, you know, between $5 and $8 a piece, so if you're excited to uh, do more of this kind of work, um, I probably have a little bit more sitting around for you, but anything beyond one or two rolls and you're on your own, I'm happy to kind of show you uh, where to buy the film. So, okay, let's say you found the camera, right, that you really want to use, and uh, lucky you, it's 35 millimeter, so you already have the film uh, sitting at home. You have uh, a 36 exposure roll of Ilford HP5 400 speed film, and uh, so that gives you 36 pictures. It tells you what you're going to set your um, ISO to on the film, but before we do anything with the film or even talk about the film, I want to make sure that you guys feel comfortable with the camera that you have, right? So, it, in, in, you know, a couple of different uh, iterations, right, most cameras of this vintage are all controlled using the same basic arrangement of features. So I'll demonstrate it on this Nikon F here, and then uh, if it's confusing to you with your equipment, we'll take a look at it in the studio and we'll work it out with you. Uh, so maybe the first biggie would be your focus, right? My left hand out here on the lens is going to control the focus ring. Uh, you're like uh, you're likely to see even a sort of a focusing uh, sort of uh, range chart on the front of that lens, which we could talk about in class. But basically, just check to make sure that your focus ring is moving, not grinding, and not stuck. You want to be able to focus what you're looking at. If you look through your eyepiece and focus that focus ring, you may even see that there are focus aids in the film uh, in the viewfinder itself. Oftentimes, you'll see sort of like a split. Um, a sort of a split focusing prism and as your image comes into plane your images will sort of cease being split and sort of line up right in the middle. It's a really excellent tool for all that manual sort of focusing that you need to do. Uh, where say you take your DSLR camera it almost never has that kind of split focusing prism. You really got to just do it by feel and so the autofocus in your DSLR is really where they probably want your uh, we don't want you to be using that. 
So by comparison, right, this plastic Holga camera also has a focus lens, right, but instead of being able to look through the lens, it literally just gives me like pictures, uh, like a picture of a close-up portrait, <laughs> maybe like a group shot, and then mountain shot, which is sort of the ubiquitous sort of like landscape, you know, uh, and those would, um, those would generally sort of transcribe into like, you know, three to four feet, maybe five to six feet, 20 feet, and then toward infinity. Uh, so, you know, it's worth paying attention to how multiple cameras sort of imagine you might be controlling the focus. Oftentimes, uh, photographers before these through the lens setups worked, they had to estimate the distance or quite literally measure off the distance uh, so that they could set their camera to have the correct depth of field focus. Now, somewhere else on the camera, you're going to find uh, the aperture ring. The aperture ring, most likely, is going to be just behind the uh, the focus ring. So we're still out here on the lens. Uh, the aperture ring has settings, right, that are usually ticked off. Uh, on this particular lens, it goes uh, f16, 11, 8, 5.6, 4, 2.8, 2, and 1.4. Those are reasonably typical f-stop readings uh, for a fixed 50 millimeter lens. Um, you notice that this is a fairly short lens, there's not any zoom on there, and so uh, that gives you a sense of you know why I have a really low f-stop, but then it tops out at f-16, right? Um, so you want to pay attention to those numbers soon because uh, we'll have to plug those numbers into our light meter or vice versa. We'll test with our light meter and then set the camera to have that correct setting. Then somewhere on the back of the camera here, most likely within reach of your right fingers, you'll find your shutter speeds. Now, the shutter speeds on this camera are red with a little white dot down here. So that goes everywhere from 1 2,000th of a second, 1,000th, 250, 150, 125, 60, 30, all the way down, down, down to 1, and then B bulb. Okay, so as I'm working through the aperture rings, make sure the aperture ring is moving. Make sure your shutter speeds are moving. Uh, run through a couple of shutter speeds, and before we do anything with film, I want you to actuate that shutter a handful of times. You know, make it 50. You know, actuate the shutter 50 times. Um, you, before you stick an $8 roll of film in that camera and waste it, you know, you want to make sure that the camera's actually shooting roughly accurately, right? You can check your shutter speeds uh, on different on, uh, sort of different settings and make sure that it actually appears to be increasing in speed or decreasing. You're very likely not going to be able to accurately measure whether those shutter speeds are quote unquote true or not, but um, it's not really the point necessarily to check if they're true. Just kind of get the gears warmed up for one thing because if nobody's taken any pictures of this camera for 20 years you know it's all gunked up on the inside speaking of gunk though uh, let's pop the lens off usually there's a small button somewhere on the other side here a button or a switch that allow you to pull the lens off check the inside now don't blow any of your moisture from your mouth into the camera at school i have a couple of these little rocket blowers that you could use to sort of blast out some of the dust that's in there. Very likely though, whatever you see in there going on is it's gonna be kind of tacked down to all those surfaces, years and years of grime and yuck and junk. Um, don't stick your fingers in there. Uh, don't try to clean off the mirrors or anything that you very likely are gonna make it worse. If, if, if anything, you'll just be kind of be negligible, but um, there's a lot of delicate parts going on in there. The mirror is moving in there, just behind the mirror is the shutter. You don't wanna get your fingers in there or anything that are gonna kind of gunk that up. And honestly, anything that's on the surface of the mirror or the ground glass is not going to affect the photographs that you make. You'll just see a little bit of texture uh, as you look through the viewfinder, but since it's not going to affect your photographs, don't mess with it, especially if it's not your camera, if you're borrowing it. One thing, though, that you might want to do is clean the back side of the lens while it's off. Start in the middle of the lens and just sort of make small circles as you go to the outside. And the same goes for the front of the lens. Now those two surfaces are really the only ones that are going to affect the image quality uh, because remember, as, as you're taking pictures, that mirror flips up and out of the way, so you're basically looking straight through the lens anyway, so the image is being unimpeded by any other surfaces. 
So we're finally at a point where if everything seems to be functioning correctly and, you know, show me if, if it's not. You know, we can talk about your camera and see if things are working differently. Your camera's not going to be like the F. It's going to be like something else. And, you know, while it might be kind of similar, it's going to be a little confusing at first for you to figure out. Uh, these cameras are dramatically simpler than your DSLRs, but there's still buttons and things on here that I didn't talk about. But for the most part, you don't need to know what they do. Uh, focus, aperture, shutter speed, those are your biggies for learning how to control this camera. And we'll talk in just a second to see about how you know what the settings are. Uh, but that, let's actually talk about how to get the film into the camera. And before we even go there, let's just do a quick talk about what is this stuff. Um, now I've, I've given you guys a roll of HP5 film, but I have a couple of dummy rolls here. You would never do this to a roll of film uh, because it will ruin it. Uh, but let me just kind of show you what's going on in this little canister here so that you can kind of get a sense of like what's happening. These canisters are light proof. All of the film that's in this canister is essentially a strip of plastic that's been emulsed on the back side. So your film has two sides. It has a film side or a plasticky side, sort of shiny, and then it should have a dull side. It's generally the back of the film or the, the side of the film where the film kind of wants to roll up on itself. These two rolls of film are pretty old. I found this in the studio. It uh, expired 20 years ago. So even though it looks brand new, there's a pretty good chance that uh, somebody has messed with this film, and so I'll use it as one of the dummies that we can roll with and experiment with. Um, but if you are thinking that you've got a halfway decent roll of film, uh, don't. Don't mess with it, right? Don't pull the film out of the container. As soon as the light hits that film, that's it. It's done. Remember, it takes a thousandth of a second to expose a picture. And if you pull this film out, it's exposed in that fraction of a second and you know essentially ruined uh, so what uh, what the camera does right is carefully measure out a small amount of light and just give it a little blip onto the film and carefully spaces it out but you notice how I can then wind that film back into the canister that's really important to know uh, because your camera will essentially do both of those functions it will pull some fresh film every new picture get some fresh film on the inside and uh, and then it winds it back into that life proof light proof container. I've got a roll of film here that a student totally botched in the developing process and you can see that it's just clear plastic uh, because in this case the emulsion was totally washed off in the developing process. Um, this is a really great example of uh, sort of you know seeing what it is that that film is made out of. It's just a strip of plastic and a very 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 thin layer of chemical that's been applied to one side and that chemical is our photosensitive light emulsion. So the next trick, right, is actually getting our cameras open, and this can be a bit of uh, this can be a bit of a trick because certain camera companies really made it tricky to get the back of the camera open. And why would they do that? Well, just remember that the film is light sensitive, and as the camera is taking pictures, it's pulling film across from the back. Um, I can see in this old camera, and I just got this from somebody who was trying to get rid of it, that there's actually film loaded in the back there. Generally, cameras kind of protect this back, right? They don't want you to open it. If you walk up to a camera and open the back while it's in the middle of taking pictures, all that film that was just pulled off to one side is ruined. There's nothing you can do to save that film. You might still have a little bit of fresh film on the inside, but that is a huge no-no. If you're not sure if there's film in your camera, bring it to school and um, I'll help you open it in a dark bag and we'll kind of test it to see if there's film in there. Because some cameras like this, you just can't see. There's no window that tells me, yes, there's film, no, there isn't film. Um, so on this Nikon F, generally speaking, here's sort of how it goes. You need to find this little film advance knob and get it pulled up. And usually, one little pop of that film knob is all it needs, and you'll see the back pop open. This camera has two sort of safety features. I've got to flip up a little lever on the bottom and rotate it, and that gives me the option to sort of open this camera up. But generally, all of those latches are located somewhere on this side of the film, so this side of the uh, camera body. So on these 35 millimeter cameras, you have to pull the little plunger up and out of the way so that the teeth don't, don't latch. And the film really only fits into your camera in one orientation, just like this, with the sort of post of the film canister facing the bottom of the camera and the sort of dog leg of film pulling out along the bottom. 
Now inevitably you have to pull a little bit of film out of your film canister in order to make this uh, in order to make this work. So essentially there's always waste involved in this process and generally you have to catch the tail of that film over on the right hand side over where your film gets advanced. The advanced lever is up here on top. So I'm going to advance click, advance click, and advance click and you see how my film has gone around the, uh, the barrel here at least one time. Uh, it's really good practice to make sure that that film is captured over here before you close the back. As soon as you close the back, we've got a light proof, uh, light proof container to do some advance click, advance click, advance click with the film. Every time I advance click the film, uh, I'm pulling fresh film in front of that window. So take a look at how every time I take a picture here, I'm pulling fresh film out of the canister and it's advancing to this bar over here. This is how most manual cameras work. Now this would all be happening obviously with the camera closed, right? But I want to kind of show you what happens as I advance, click, advance, click through this roll of film. Okay, so at that point I felt the film stop. And there is a counter on the top of the film, right, that would tell me how many exposures, how many clicks I've made. Sometimes those counters get broken, though. So when you feel the film stop you, don't try to pull it harder. Um, occasionally, right, the little bit of tape that's holding the film inside the canister can actually just tear right out. And then you're stuck with all of your film loaded over here on the exposed side. Uh, ideally, though, I would like to be able to take all of my film and wind it back into this light-sensitive container. And so I could flip up the little wind knob on the top of the film, but I can't wind it back in. There's a little break over here on the right-hand side that's usually released with a small button somewhere near the bottom of the camera. Once I push that button, I hear a tiny little tick, and that frees up the break so that I can advance the film back into the container. These manually wind cameras, you just kind of have to feel that wind go, 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 all the way back. And you're pulling all 36 exposures back into the camera. Obviously, you're doing this with the camera closed, uh, and so it's a bit of a uh, doing it by feel thing. Uh, but you'll get the sense almost immediately when the tension comes off the sort of exposed side of the film barrel because it gets really easy. You'll hear a little pop. It gets really easy and you just suck that tail right back into the film uh, so that you're uh, light safe again. Then that film can come back out of the camera and we're ready for development. Let's do that one more time. I'm gonna load this film up so that you guys can get a sense of what it's gonna look like when you're ready to go. Uh, I load the film over here onto the exposed side. I give a couple of advanced clicks to make sure that that film is properly captured. Once it goes around the barrel at least one time, I know I'm good. Then you close up the camera body. Now, check your film counter. It's very likely set to something like S, and once you're set to S, you can then advance the film until it gets to the first exposure. You basically have to pull some fresh film out of the way, uh, because remember, this film has all been exposed, right? Uh, this film has all been exposed, it's no good. I need to pull a couple of exposures of fresh film out of that film canister. So with two advances, I'm set up at exposure zero. That pretty much puts me at a point where I'm ready to shoot. Now, at this point, um, you know, travel with the lens cap and travel with a secondary light meter. Um, I recommend actually just downloading uh, a free light meter app on your phone. And essentially how it works is you point your phone out in the general direction of where you plan to take your picture. The, ca the uh, iPhone's camera is going to take a light meter reading for you and show you uh, sort of what the ideal settings are. And you can make some adjustments. You can say, well, I really want to shoot that um, 1 60th of a second what should my f-stop be? So at 1 60th, it'll tell you 5.6 or something like that. So adjust your f-stop, adjust your shutter speed, frame the picture, and you're off shooting your first roll of film.